Okay, so Rob, it's great to have you on the show. I saw your bio before we hit, you know, the record button, and I was immediately interested in this conversation. I think I told you I just came back from this Goodwill, um, essentially national uh, meeting, and I know you've got a strong connection uh, in that regard as well. But I, would you kind of walk me through again, and, and our listeners as well, um, how your interaction with a homeless person not that long ago kind of changed your life and your mission. And um, I think it's a fascinating story. I think that, you know, homelessness is is a bigger and bigger issue that we're dealing with, uh, as I do believe that I think companies have not only the responsibility to their shareholders and employees, but also their communities, and that we can become a great engine for social change if we see it that way you've really done that you've really taken that to that level but tell us the that tipping point when you're when your mind just sort of went wow um i'm now learning more from this person than maybe i thought that i would but tell us that story and then i'd love to kind of get into the kind of work that you're doing to support the homeless and to support your community well i i stopped to pick up this guy's name was tim mccann uh, well, I didn't stop to pick him up. I stopped to talk to him. He said he would work for food. And in Michigan, we have these gray October days where it's rain and the sky and the ground look the same. It's just gray. And so I felt sorry for him. And uh, he said, sure enough. And and uh, bottom line, I said, hey, if you're there uh, at the same place on Monday, because this was a Saturday, I'll pick you up. So I figured, hey, I'm going to put a little bit of a, a barrier of entry in, in place mm -hmm. and gave him 20 bucks. And uh, um, he was not downtown Grand Rapids. He was in the suburbs and that's why I stopped. It was really unusual place for anybody to be panhandling. And this was 17 years ago. So this wasn't like today's, you know, homeless situation. And sure enough, he was there Monday, um, put him to work. Um, obviously I paid him. I wasn't going to, um, you know, just feed him food, but I got him housing. Um, after about 10 days, I needed some stuff done at my home and, uh, I live on uh, 60 plus acres. So there's always something going on with animals or kids, you know, or the property. And he started working for me on a Saturday with me. And, um, my assumption that the homeless were slow, lazy, not smart, you know, I mean, really wasn't intentionally being prejudiced towards them, um, but grew up with a parents that, you know, if you can swing a hammer or push a broom, you have a job. So that's, that's how I was raised. So I didn't understand how anybody couldn't be homeless. And he, he was smart, hard worker, Great to work with, very, very pleasant guy to work with. Um, instantly bonded with him, which I was surprised. Um, and so it just all of a sudden gave me pause. And and ultimately, I uh, got to be really good friends with Tim. Um, after about eight weeks, though, he, he started drinking again. Um, and he had told me about his story. And, and I realized if I had had... Back then, smoking pot, you got put in jail. And so he mm. was put in jail or juvie, I think around 14 years old. Well, then with school and everything else, uh, his father had been killed. His mom was with a stepfather. I really realized that if I had grown up in that same environment, I probably would have had a very similar life. Hopefully not. But um, he ended up going to jail had a felony. Um, so he couldn't get a job. It's not, it was, it's not like today where it's felony friendly. Um, back then, if you had a felony, you didn't get a job. So you're without. Yeah. There was a stigma. Yep. So yeah. he ended up, um, started drinking. I connected him to guiding Lake mission, which is a local mission. Um, he ended up, I ended up being his mentor. He called me two days later and says, Hey, they said, I need a mentor. I said, Oh, that's great. And he goes, well, I want you to be the mentor. <laughs> I'm like, no. So I mentored him, then ended up being on the board of directors for Guiding Lake Mission, uh, led their 
long-term strategic plan, which um, they're really following pretty much today. Um, the mission ended up um, having financial problems, even though they've been in business for about 50 years. Um, I thought, boy, I've done my good deeds. So I thought if they close, I'm done because Tim has already moved on. And uh, the executive director resigned. Uh, the board members caught me getting into my vehicle and they said, hey, you know who should run this place? And I said, I have no idea. Because I'm a suburban guy. <laughs> I know guy. where this is going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tell you, your audience is going to say, well, this is the slowest, dullest uh, guy you've had on there. I'm not super <laughs> smart. Um, so I ended up stepping in, being the interim executive director. Three weeks later, my background's finance, real estate, large finance company. I should have looked at their finances closer. Um, they just didn't have the revenue coming in. They were going to close. Um, really had a God moment where right as I'm getting ready to hit send on my resume or my resignation to the board and to the, the local newspaper, um, about, I think it was $38,000 came in. And oh, if wow. it wasn't me, you know, I'm ex army officer, really focused finance business. I'm not a kumbaya guy, but I turned off the computer and I said, okay, Lord, let's rock and roll. Yeah, and let's was, do it. Not, not a real Christian prayer, but I'm like, and yeah. we turned around the mission and that's what got me started. And Exodus Place was set, I had negotiated with a seller. It used to be the old Michigan Department of Corrections facility for the their halfway house. And, um, for uh, Hobby Lobby was going to be the um, buyer and donate it to the rescue mission. The rescue mission said, hey, you just got us out of the fire. We're still in the skillet. So we're going to turn that down. And I thought, Dean, I thought, boy, I'm going back to my regular life. Um, and I did, since I had gotten the mission out of trouble, paid down their debt, Increased their PL by 6,400% in nine months. So, I mean, it was mm. a pretty drastic turnaround. And uh, ultimately, um, I left. And about two weeks later, just had a God moment where I said, Hey, I God wants me to do this. So, I started with four homeless guys. Um, I had learned that instead of having preconceived notions of what they could or couldn't do, I just treat them like I treated my real estate staff, my finance staff and said, mm. we're going to start teaching you how to operate a business. I've always wondered that the fear of interacting with homeless people for those who are not, is that we are, connecting to our greatest fear of ourselves that we would lose it all that we would end up on the street not having a place to stay and to, it, and to interact with those people part of that fear to do so is to come face to face with your own fear about something that you don't want to talk about like i'm afraid of maybe my business going under i'm afraid that i won't be able to supply uh, food on the table for my family. And, and now I meet somebody who is living that nightmare. I don't want to see that nightmare. And so therefore, let's just keep our window closed and move on. And um, I remember, Rob, once I think you and I, we've talked uh, about our affinity with Goodwill. Um, they had what was called a poverty simulation. And so you brought 50, 60 different people from the community into a large room to pretend through a series of through a series of scenarios to be in a family uh given certain challenges that you had to act out within a certain time frame and you had social services there to support you um, but you began to realize that the services really were not there to support you and that they were um the system in itself was sort of inadvertently designed not to help people get out of this cycle of poverty 
And I remember one time, I think it was the father of my little group that we were, you know, play acting in. And I think I had a daughter and maybe a, an elderly person living in my family. And um, I think I lost my job. My car had broken down and I had a drug addict son. And so these are the circumstances that I'm playing acting in the simulation. And for the first time, I thought maybe crime is the answer. Maybe I should start stealing some stuff. And it really like surprised me because I don't consider myself. I've never had a thought of crime. You know, I've never done anything that would, um, you know, lead to doing something really illegal. Right. I mean, and I went, wow, talk about a paradigm shift. Not to say that I did, not to say that people who are in that circumstances do, but the fact that it occurred to me as an option su completely surprised me. So I think what your work you're doing is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and so what, what sort of outcomes have you been seeing in your community as a result of all of this energy that you've been placing into this, this nonprofit? What's been, what, are the, what, 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 what are the success stories? Probably our biggest one is we, we, me being business, created a dashboard. So we, we measure all of our outcomes and the KPIs. I mean, a little bit, you know, I'm not the yeah. usual nonprofit. I, I got that. Right. Um, the one that really comes out the, the biggest is our recidivism rate is right mm. now right about 1%. Mm. Uh, when I started, our recidivism rate was about 45 to 50%. Wow, that's incredible. To jail or prison. Um, in fact, you would have a guy in the building and all of a sudden they disappear and you go where'd so-and-so go oh yeah. you got picked up he's in, in jail or he's on his way back to prison because he just committed a crime yeah um and so that that's been a super rewarding success for me and then um my focus is to cure homelessness because we're transitional housing we're not yeah. we're not a rescue mission rescue mission is more of an emergency room it's like right. you don't spend your time in the emergency room at the hospital. So my goal always is to cure homelessness. So when a guy comes in, um, my staff is always trying to assess and give them the needed skills or the contacts. Um, so like a prim primary care provider. So right now um, we've seen a little bit of a gap in our our dashboard of people having a primary care provider. So we're partnering with another nonprofit to ensure that all the men have a primary care provider. So when they leave, they don't um, crowd the, the um, emergency room because they treat that as the primary care provider, which then let's say if you or I or family member end up having an accident, and they needed stitches, and we have somebody that came from our facility that, let's just say, has a sore throat, and they're at the emergency room. Well, you know, that's not the right placement. So we do a lot of those community-based uh, items to to teach the men, you know, where to go, um, how to get the services. And we walk alongside them while they're at Exodus, but when they leave, we want them to know no, you don't go to the emergency room. You don't call the ambulance. You you call your primary care provider mm -hmm. and you get an appointment. What is it, aside from the, um, the obvious benefit to the people you serve, how have you seen people who are serving those people transform, yourself included, to be on the side of, I'm, I'm here to support and help these people into this transitional housing situation, how has it changed their lives? Well, it's, you can't measure glee, but you really, I mean, mm. the, the amount of reward you get from that, um, like I'll have new staff come in um, or even a, a one of our staff member that's been there a long time and they celebrate that so-and-so got an apartment or so-and-so was able to move into a house with two other guys. Um, so 
like my staff, my volunteers, um, they see that and they just get that huge reward of, boy, I made a difference in one person's life. And mm -hmm. that's that's a critical thing. We don't, you know, in, in business right now, internet, everything's to scale. How are you scaling your business? How are you scaling your business? And and really we look at as, you know, scaling our business is taking care of one person at a time. We got to treat them as a person and not try to, to, to scale past the person just, just for number state, because once we get to statistics, well, then it, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. So just wow, a lot great. of, um, you know, just a lot of, I don't know, just, People I love can't. the word glee. I mean, that I, I wrote that down as you were talking, Rob. Like that, just that just sort of like had such a great tone to it, you know. But people don't normally say, "Hey, Rob, how was your day today?" Well, I felt glee. You know, you don't you yeah. don't say that, but it's such a great, potent experience, and that you say that people are experiencing that. I think that's fantastic, and that people who are doing the service have a direct ability or tie into the benefit that they're creating. I've got this really lately a strong awareness that we are not aware of the impact that we have in other people. That a probably, and this is just a spitball, you know, putting your finger up and where's the wind blowing. But I think we probably have about a 30% awareness that, of the impact that we have in other people. And maybe even out of that 30%, we really only have 10% that we really fr truly understand it. The other 70%, who knows, you know, what impact we have, you know, we, we, we meet people, we talk to them and they go on and they do their thing. Maybe a customer, maybe it's an employee, they go home and talk to their family. We don't know what happens as a result of the work that we did for them because they, they because they we're just busy. We don't, they, there's no feedback loop, right? Nope. And, and so when you say these people are experiencing glee, that to me says I have a direct connection between the work that I did and the benefit it created. How rare is that? That's fantastic. It's, well done. Yeah, I, I think I love it. I mean, I had a guy contact me uh, Friday. His mother passed away at two twenty, and he had been in our facility. He's been out for five years, successful, and he contacted me at, at two thirty seven. So 17 months after his mom passed away and he said, Hey, just want to let you know, my mom passed away. She brought him to our facility and he goes, I want to thank you for who you were to me because I'm not homeless anymore. And, and, and he had been bouncing from being homeless. So he's, he's been out on his own for five years. And like you said, you you don't know who you're impacting and that's why you get I, I i think if you treat everybody as a person as an individual and you you're with them when you're with them it, it makes a big difference so robin what i'm trying to I'm, I'm drawing a connection here so for the listeners who are paying attention to this you know just because you may not have a job that helps the homeless doesn't mean that you can't take what Rob just said and apply it into your work or into your family, you know, treat people as people really listen, really understand them, be empathetic. But again, and add on to this, Rob, what other things can people do as they listen to your story that they say, I love the story. It's great, but I just don't have right now the, the business that does the kind of work that you do, but yet you've learned some timeless, valuable principles what other things should we be taking from that and applying whether or not we serve the homeless well i think culture um you know if if people um if we all look at culture and especially leaders well really anybody in an organization looking at culture um what i did at exodus we have nearly zero violence. I have 135 men there. Um, the majority of my staff are women and they're lean more to the petite side than the, you know, big husky side. 
probably not politically correct, but you know, they're not, they don't look like linebackers. Let's just say that. Understood. No, I'm uh, taking. And, um, but I created a culture that said, Hey, there's no violence. We're, we're here to help you. And so even, uh, somebody that's listening to this, everybody knows somebody that's, that is down and out. If you, if you pause, because you'll see somebody with anxiety um, you'll see somebody that's nervous and maybe they're not homeless, but in the back of their mind, they're worried about being homeless. Like you said yeah. earlier, which is yeah. a perfect example. Talk about being scared. I mean, if, if you're really supposed to have uh, five people around you that are going to be the, your greatest influence, and then you got five homeless guys you're around, or let's say three homeless guys and two right. successful, you're probably going to go towards being homeless. But right. if you have um, a high level of emotional intelligence and, and you utilize your intellect to say, okay, now, um, what's going on? Why are you homeless? And start asking those questions. Um, we get away from some of the emotion of worrying about becoming homeless because once you start hearing why somebody is homeless, well, I'm addicted to crack. Well, I'm not going to do crack, okay? Um, or um, I have a gambling problem or I have uh, PTSD or I'm bipolar or I'm on the spectrum someplace that it's not fitting with uh, socializing, we can um, we can just look at the culture that we keep around us and say, look, we're going to increase our emotional intelligence to elevate people. Um, we don't have, like with the listeners, we don't have to go down to where they're at with the anxiety. We don't have to go down to where they're at with the drugs and alcohol. I've been doing this for 17 years. Um, I've never been arrested. I've never lost my driver's license. I've, you know, I, you know, I, I pay my bills. So I'm around people that that should be the influence that's overwhelming me when they're, I got 135 men and we, we do, uh, we turn over our, our population about four times a year, hmm. almost five. So with that many people, you know, I've learned a high level emotional intelligence and then seeing that person of where they're at, asking the upstream questions, you know, what's causing you to be homeless? You know, the, the first, first answer will be no money. Well, that, it's kind of an easy keep going upstream and find out, especially successful business people, men and women, you, you're trained to ask questions of your customers, your, your clients, your employees. And so if, if they can ask more questions of why, how, what can I do to help um, or guide the person on what, what they need to help. Um, sometimes our Big thing at Exodus is not uh, alcohol and illegal drugs. It's actually um, legal prescriptive medicine and poor health care. So mm. let's say- And housing now too. Housing's a byproduct. Um, we never, we, we don't attack housing first. Um, we go for the relationship first and see what the problem is. Ah. Um, once you take care of, let's say, a bipolar person and get them stability or somebody that has an alcohol problem or drug problem, once I get them stable um, and their mind starts functioning and, and we start getting some really productive conversation, then they can understand, oh, housing is important. But when, when you're down and out, it, they, they don't care. They, they no, I, I, you you bring up a great point, Rob. I mean, it's sort of like behavior follows perception, right? I mean, we're going to take care of our housing once we have the mindset that we deserve housing. We can think that housing is within our future. All of those things that one could associate mindset to outcomes. That you're you're. I think you're right on that. You're exactly right. Perception. There, 
you're normal, they're not. I'm normal, yeah. they're not. It's like, right. no, we're right. all together, but their perception is they're not worthy. Right. So it was a I, great I, Go ahead. Oh, I can give them a penthouse and and they'll be they'll be out on the street typically within two, three days later if they don't have good case management and in a, a relationship. It's interesting. I think there is obviously we've heard these statistics before that when somebody wins the lottery, most of them actually lose all of the money within a few years or a year and sometimes even more than they had actually won. And so if your mindset doesn't match to the, the wealth that you've been granted, you're good, probably going to, you know, squander it away. I was thinking about my dad recently because he since passed, but you know, he was reporter for the star tribune out of Minneapolis. And this all sounds like it somewhat comes back to the D institutionalization, the D institutionalization. If I can say that word tip of the tongue, teeth and lips of the mental health pop of, of mental health, where we would put people who were in mental health facilities and we had them set up for people. And then I don't know whether it was Congress, I forget, and I had to go back in my notes, sort of, you know, took all that away, stopped funding it. And all those people who used to be in homes getting support are now on the streets. And we're still living the, the ripple effect of those decisions that are like 30, 40 years old. Um, so I think this is, I just love what you're about, man. I, I really do. And I, I wanted just to uh, maybe ask you one other other any other types of um, ways that you've been able to create the culture for your team that um, finds a way to serve those who are going through some really tough stuff. I guess, you know, sometimes what I've noticed with giving people is that they they're so empathetic, they feel what their clients feel. The nurse deals with a patient who is going through a potential death experience and they experience it with them. And then they go home and they're just like a wreck. I remember once walking through Mayo Clinic years ago and I saw all sorts of patients in different levels of severe disease and listening in on conversations because I was shadowing a particular doctor at the time. And I came home and I just wanted to cry. And my <laughs> wife said, what happened at work today? And I said, I think I took on all of this really sad energy with my, and I wasn't really talking to them. I was just around them. How have you helped your people serve empathetically, serve with passion and heart without taking it on where it becomes their own trauma? Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, in one sense, I'm good and bad uh, person to ask. I mean, when I got started, I would, I can remember my wife would take her kids to the high school football on a Friday night, and they wanted to play with their kids because they're teenagers. So I stayed at home, and I remember watching the TV, and all of a sudden, my wife would come in, and I'd be crying. And, you know, it just because that whole week built up. Mm. you'd see somebody commit suicide or an overdose or you would hear the the background of the trauma some of these people guys went through so yeah i i think at this point i think it's i don't callous is not a really great word but you build up a muscle um and what we train at exodus is love compassion and accountability mm. And I said, hey, we're going to lead off with love and we're going to get taken advantage of. We we'll just are. Let's just understand it. And it's going to irritate you. It's going to make you mad. Because if you've ever helped somebody down and out, they've either taken advantage of you, stole from you, done something, didn't keep a commitment. And then we give them compassion. So compassion is, hey, um, it, it's more direct. Um so we're we're helping them through um, some trauma and, and get through. And but the last one is accountability. So I set the account. We have three columns. That one column, I said it's accountability. Um, they have to show up to make a difference in their lives. If we have to chase them down to make a difference in their lives, they don't want our help. We can't make them want our help. 
So important what you just said. And that again can go into a homeless situation. It could go into a family situation or a colleague at work. People don't want help. There's nothing you can do to convince them otherwise. No, they'll, they'll play victim. Right. All those parents out there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I, your kids they don't play, want your help. They're not going to take it. I, the biggest thing we look for is the victim mentality. And, and people go, wait a second. They just came from prison. Oh, my gosh. I'm a victim. And they'll say, right. I'm a victim. And I'm like, no, you created victims. You became a victim out of your own you know, behavior, which became the only powerful way you can get out of this is get out of your way of being a victim. And let's start creating a, a positive life for yourself. So I guess I'm going back to this theme here, Rob, over and over again, is that really what you're trying to do is helping people change their mindset about what's possible for themselves in their life to bring out the highest and best of who they are, which means a, a shift of perception, a shift of what they feel they deserve, letting go of the shame, letting go of whatever mental blocks that kept them from that. And, and, and which is, I, you know, it's funny because it's not funny. It's, it's just, it happens because people who do, do drugs, let's just use as an example, uh -huh. right? they don't do it because they want to destroy their life. They're doing it for a positive reason. Now you and I might go like, well, that was a stupid decision to do this. Right. But you know, people make the best decision they see that is available to them at that time. And it's there to support something, you know, I'm, I'm in pain. This, this is going to help me relieve the pain. Like it's all done out of something that's going to hopefully help me, even though it probably doesn't. And I do think that really you're in the business of changing mindsets. Well, isn't that what we do in business too? Absolutely. I, mean, I have, uh, I'm changing, um, <clears throat> Uh, my bookkeeper and my CPA went through things and he goes, Rob, you weren't, because I also own a fair amount of commercial real estate and I was getting my financials quarterly. And then uh, I didn't get them for like five months. And he goes, didn't you realize that they probably weren't doing it? And I go, well, I was sending all the information I assumed. And I'm like, Oh, wait a second whether it's drugs or I'm not paying attention to my business. I mean, you know, fortunately my CPA is catching everything up. Um, mm. But we do these self-destructive things. And at first I wanted to say I was a victim. Okay. Right. Right. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm not a victim. I'm a grown man. I, yeah. I, I know I'm supposed to get, I really prefer, all, you know, at our nonprofit, we get all of our, uh, we close our books by the 10th of every month. It's just absolutely religious. I mean, it's, it's always there. Our dashboards always complete. I mean, it's, a, I don't think we've missed anything, a, a, a deadline in probably 10, 12 years, more than 10 years. And then on my personal, I allowed it to happen. And we kind of have our own, you know, sometimes we get, so successful and then we think well i don't deserve it it's going too well i i'm not going to pay attention to this part of my business or this yeah. part of my life and then it, the negative happens and you go for me well geez i'm a victim why did that person screw up well, mm -hmm. i screwed up and so I kind of, I take that same philosophy and work with the men and I share with them. I'll, I'll tell them stupid stuff. I tell them I'm a donut aholic. Me, if I eat one donut, I'm eating a dozen. And <laughs> they laugh and they go, that's different. I said, is it really diabetes, everything else? I mean, right. uh, so we're so right. much a, the same, but we have some different outcomes. Absolutely. And I love the fact that that's what you are about is finding those commonalities and that what we can learn from anybody, whether they're, they're going through a tough time or not. I was just having a conversation over dinner with somebody I've known for quite a few years. And I learned all sorts of stuff that's going on in his life that I went, oh my God, I mean, some of the burdens that people are walking around with that we just are not aware of just not aware of their, their own version of homelessness, although they might be 
you know, may, may, may have a home, but a trauma that is as big as we're all walking around with that. I guess I wanted just to um, call out a couple of quick things and then um, ask people to, or ask you to tell people about how to connect with you. Um, those of you, I know you and I talked about goodwill and so forth and, and nonprofits. Um, and I know that we, a lot of people are out there that support nonprofits, which I, I think they should. Great video. I think I shared it with you um, by a guy named Dan Pallotta on uh, TED called How We Think About Charity is Dead Wrong. Talk about changing your mindset. I mean, that's a great one. So if you're involved in any sort of nonprofit, if you write a check to any sort of nonprofit, listen to this video. It's extraordinarily great. If you support um, thrift retail, my goodwill to be able to help um, the, your, your community be very careful about what is a nonprofit and what is a for-profit. There's a lot of bins out there. You think that they're nonprofit and they're not. They take your stuff and they repackage them. They, they sell them back to you. Um, there's, you know, Savers is a for-profit company. It's not a nonprofit company, whereas <laughs> Goodwill is. So I had to call that out because they are one of our favorite um, companies and clients and their mission is very dear to my heart. So last but not least, Rob, um, how can people follow your work and follow you? Well, if you go to exodusplace.org, that's the easiest place to follow Exodus Place. And then uh, if people want to connect with me, my website's uh, Rob, R-O-B-B-M-U-N-G-E-R dot com. Um, I, I help and mentor quite a few nonprofit leaders. So. Well, great. Uh, you, I mean, again, those of you who are not nonprofit leaders, so what? Uh, what Rob just shared with us is really so important about changing mindset, seeing the whole human being, creating a culture that um, is about love and about compassion, about accountability. Those are messages that we can apply in any organization. But thank you, sir. It's great to know you. Thank you, Dean.